Yes. Richard Nixon. Think about it. Who is the one man who has the experience and the qualifications to lead America in these troubled, dangerous times? Nixon's the one. Nixon carried 32 states and held 43.4% of the vote in the 1968 U.S. elections, becoming the 37th President of the United States. He was loved by many and promised to reunite an America divided by war by making peace in Vietnam. Between 1969 and 1974, Nixon shifted from being a visage of peace to the man who betrayed the American people. Good evening. President Nixon reportedly will announce his resignation tonight. One word says it all. Watergate. Nixon's election campaign ran with the promise to bring home the U.S. troops from Vietnam. I end the war at once by ordering the immediate withdrawal of all American forces. When he broke that promise, the anti-war movement was an outrage. The protests were growing rapidly. Feeling threatened, President Nixon resorted to drastic measures in order to fight the protesters. There was a group of, uh, I think, six or eight men gathered in the Oval Office. I was there. And the president, uh, he, he really took the bark off. He, he, he laid it out to them that he was fed up with the, the bickering between the intelligence groups and, and, and between the directors themselves. The nut of this was that uh, President Nixon wanted very much to get more information and if he could just lay his hands on some foreign element that was supporting this activism then he would have a good political axe with which to uh, uh, wage his own domestic war. The president issued a secret executive order. It gave the intelligence agencies a free hand to bug telephones, open mail, and break into private homes and offices, overriding legal safeguards on citizens' rights. Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. Good evening. We have a mystery story out of Washington. Five people have been A break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C., and the Nixon administration's attempted cover-up of its involvement began the scandal that ruined his career. The burglars forced a stairwell door, then taped its latch open. The door, now part of police evidence, was noticed by one of the guards employed by the Watergate complex. At first, the police found nothing. Then they spied five men crouching behind some desks. Neither the president, obviously, or anybody in the White House, or anybody in authority in any of the committees working for the re-election of the president, have any responsibility for it? In March 1972, the General Counsel to the Committee for the Re-Election of the President approved a plan which involved burglaring the Democratic National Committee's headquarters at the Watergate Complex in Washington, D.C., the purpose of which was to photograph documents and install listening devices. James W. McCord, Jr., Bernard Barker, Francis Sturgis, Virgilio Gonzalez, and Eugenio Martinez, who were arrested for breaking and entering the DNC headquarters on June 17, 1972. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel -gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Hearings to bear the truth about the wide range of illegal, unethical, or improper activities established or still merely alleged surrounding the re-election of President Nixon last year. Hearings that followed the arrest revealed that the committee was keeping tight-lipped and secretive. Indeed, an audio tape revealed that many were being paid off. I taped it in order to protect myself. How are we doing? Well, uh, not as well can be expected. How are you? Uh, just about the same. In fact, I was setting my own, uh, preparing my own noose because the things he said in that tape were furthering the cover-up. We're protecting the guys who were really responsible. But now that that's, uh, and of course, that's a continuing uh, requirement. But at the same time, this is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. I told him that loyalty is a two-way street. We've been loyal to them. They hadn't been loyal to us. We think that there's a time when some moves should be made. And certainly the cheapest commodity available is money. These lawyers have not been paid. 
I was trying to shut him up. He was talking about money, and I could just, I knew what was going on. I mean, in my heart of heart, I, I knew this guy was blackmailing us. The Senate tonight voted 77 to nothing to establish a select committee to investigate the Watergate bugging case. The committee will be headed by North Carolina Democrat Sam Urban. We really got down to the bottom line, and that was, and this is the, the premise of the entire session we've had, was that all those who had been arrested were going to remain silent. And Ehrlichman finally asked me this question, and I said, there's no way, I don't know if they're going to remain silent. I mean, they were caught red-handed. Uh, the, the question was whether the White House was involved. And it seemed to me that, that, that the line had to be drawn between those defendants and the White House. And the answer was, they were going to have to be paid off. While the Nixon administration denied any tie to the burglaries, the FBI's investigation quickly revealed a money trail that linked the bank accounts of the five men directly to the Committee for the Re-Election of the President. And at 10.02 this morning, Senator Irvin gabbled open hearings that well may well become just as historic. Hearings that followed the arrest revealed that the committee was keeping tight-lipped and secretive. Those that did come forward revealed much about the goings-on in the Oval Office, including White House assistant Alexander Butterfield, revealing that the White House had a recording system in the Oval Office. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. After a protracted series of bitter court battles, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the president had to hand over the tapes to government investigators. Ultimately, he complied. Nixon announced the release of the transcripts in a speech to the nation on April 29, 1974. Every day absorbed by Watergate is a day lost from the work that must be done by your president and by your Congress. Work that must be done in dealing with the great problems that affect your prosperity. The materials I make public tomorrow will provide all the additional evidence needed to get Watergate behind us and to get it behind us now. Recordings from these tapes implicated the President, revealing he had attempted to cover up the questionable and illegal goings-on that had taken place after the break-in. We have a cancer within the close to the presidency that's growing. Now, the black reel is continuing. Hunt called one of the lawyers from the re-election committee on last Friday to meet with him on over the weekend. Uh, Hunt now is demanding another $72,000 for his own personal expenses, another $50,000 to pay his attorney's fees, $127,000. Uh, Mitchell has been working on raising some money. Uh, feeling he's got, you know, he's got one, he's one of the ones the most to lose. Uh, but there's no denying the fact that the White House and uh, Ehrlichman, Holland, and Dean are involved in some of the early money decisions. I would say these people are going to cost uh, a million dollars over the next uh, few years. The tapes revealed crucial conversation that took place between the President and his consul, John Dean, on March 21, 1973. In this conversation, Dean summarized many aspects of the Watergate case and focused on the subsequent cover-up, describing it as a cancer on the presidency. Back in the Oval Office, Nixon held a crisis meeting. A new scapegoat had to be found. There was a great choosing up of sides as to who was going to do that. And Nixon kept saying, well, it should be somebody who's very familiar with the facts. Well, I didn't get it at first, but what, what he was doing was pointing at me. On April 30th, Nixon asked for the resignation of Haldeman and Ehrlichman, two of his most influential aides, both of whom were indicted, convicted, and ultimately sentenced to prison. The President announced the resignations in an address to the American people.
On March 1, 1974, a grand jury in Washington, D.C. indicted several former aides of the president, who became known as the Watergate Seven, Haldeman, Elrickman, Mitchell, Charles Colson, Gordon C. Strachan, Robert Mardian, and Kenneth Parkinson for conspiring to hinder the Watergate investigation. The scandal that brought down the 37th presidency, known as the Watergate scandal, is the biggest political scandal in American history. In fact, the term Watergate has subsequently become synonymous with corruption and abuse of power. From the discussions I have had with congressional and other leaders, I have concluded that because of the Watergate matter, I might not have the support of the Congress that I would consider necessary to back the very difficult decisions and carry out the duties of this office in the way the interests of the nation will require. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Facing near certain impeachment, the U.S. House of Representatives and a strong possibility of a conviction in the Senate, Nixon resigned the presidency on August 9, 1974. The editors of the newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, a publication that had supported Nixon, wrote, He is humorless to the point of being inhuman. He is devious. He is profane. He is willing to be led. He displays dismaying gap of knowledge. He is suspicious of his staff. His loyalty is minimal. The Watergate scandal is one that shook the United States. In a time when peace was on the forefront of social issues, the Nixon administration removed people's rights to privacy, freedom of speech, and freedom of peaceful demonstration. It infringed on the democratic right to vote by tampering with the system and shocked people who put blind faith in their government. What Nixon did, the, the extent of the criminality and the brazenness of it, the disregard of the law, the idea of the President of the United States orchestrating a campaign to obstruct justice and protect himself and pay hush money to people who could testify against his aides. I mean, it, it was a massive criminal conspiracy. The idea that an incumbent president would use a series of you know, illegal break-ins, wiretaps, fundraising techniques, dirty tricks, and so forth to keep the other party from nominating their strongest candidate so he can win. Well, the uh, secret government is the big thing to worry about, the big danger, and of course Nixon uh, practiced secret government. You listen to his tapes now and you realize I mean, the, the political and moral and historical lesson is he was using the presidency as an instrument of personal revenge and reward. Whether or not Richard Nixon had the best interests of the American people at heart, there is no doubt that the corruption that occurred in the Nixon administration was a sign of bad government and a sign of a bad president.